All right, so welcome everyone to finding open educational resources for your courses. My name is Casey Long. Uh, with me today is Kat Greer and Christopher Bishop. Um, and we have been thinking deeply about how to reduce cost uh, for both students and for Agnes Scott as an institution in terms of course materials. So what we're gonna cover today is why it is important to begin using OERs and licensed library materials as course materials, what does the term OERs actually mean? Where can you find OERs, these open educational resources? And then for those disciplines that don't feel like there's much for them in terms of the OERs, how can you utilize library resources uh, to supplement your course materials? And so for some of your departments, that's gonna be the most important area, but we are super excited to introduce you to the OERs. So to get us started, Kat is gonna uh, tell us a little bit about what are OERs and um, what are some of the potential concerns and opportunities that are available with them? Uh, thank you, Casey. Um, so with thinking about OERs, um, they are broadly defined as educational materials available in any kind of format um, that is available are released under an open license, usually Creative Commons, um, that permits their um, free use and repurposing by others. So again, these are any kind of materials that can be used in an educational context that allow uh, their free use and repurpose. We go to the next slide, Casey. Um, so uh, in the survey that we sent out, um, so these are some of the course materials that um, were felt to be the most useful in courses. Um, and all of these types of materials can be considered OERs. Uh, they're not just textbooks. They can be any of these um, variety of um, supplemental or ancillary materials. Uh, any of these could necessarily be considered open educational resources. Um, so thinking about some of the opportunities and challenges around open educational resources, these are some of the feedback that also came in the survey and that um, Chris and Casey and I have discussed among ourselves. Um, so the first thing is, of course, authority and quality. Um, so uh, the first thing here is defining, you know, what means quality and what are you looking for? And that ultimately... Um, relies on you to determine whether that quality exists in the resource and whether it meets your needs. Um, so in, we have created a libguide for OERs. Um, and if somebody will put that link to the chat, um, you can go on there and there is a checklist um, created by the University of Maryland uh, Global Campus. Um, and it, um, we think is a good resource, a good tool for you to take and evaluate OERs. So it looks at things like making sure that licensing terms um, are, are prevalent uh, that allow you to reuse that material, uh, things like ADA accessibility, um, looking at currency and relevance, um, the interface and user experience, and uh, other perspectives that, that would be valuable with OERs. Um, this can take time initially, um, but uh, it, over time, as you get more used to looking for certain aspects, it should take less time. And, and uh, we want to relate to you that we are also a resource that we can help you in that journey in helping determine authority and quality. Um, the second thing is the as a big one is time and effort that just takes to to implement these materials and potentially redesign your courses. Um, you know, there's a reason in, institutions that implemented um, grant opportunities for faculty to use and develop OER is because there's a time and effort component that really needs to be compensated, right? Um, so OERs, um, even though they're freely available, they're ra rarely off the shelf ready to use for your course. They need to be modified. They need to be structured that, so they fit within your course context um, and to make them meaningful and effective. Um, so with this, we really wanna stress that um, a gradual adoption. So looking at um, a piece of your course and how you could possibly implement OERs whether, rather than trying to completely overhaul 
um, your entire course at for one semester. Um, so looking at more gradual augmentation of uh, aspects of your course, if that's possible. Uh, another aspect is the desire for inclusive and diversive narratives. Um, so we acknowledge that ASC faculty typically has um, taken a different route when it comes to instructional materials and looking for different you know, non-traditional narratives. And um, we can't guarantee that OERs are going to include these narratives, but we think that there are options available. So um, that's just something that, uh, even going back to that checklist that I had referred to earlier, there's a piece on there to where um, you can, you know, gauge that OER and, and how it meets that um, criteria for you. Uh, the next one is lack of coverage in certain areas. Um, and we both acknowledge that this is true um, and this can be a problem. And in this case, um, maybe library license materials would be a better solution for your content if those OER um, capabilities just aren't there. Um, and so supplementary and also supplementary materials may be what's more available rather than say a whole textbook. Um, so it just depends on um, what's available and but there we think there are options um, for you know a variety of courses. And the last one is um, something that I I've, feel like I've heard a lot is the availability of those ancillary supplemental materials. And I think that that is something that uh, others have um, noticed and recognized. And that's something that those are increasingly available along with OER. So you get a textbook and you also get say uh, a syllabus or examples of assignments or test banks. And those things are um, available. And I think that is all that I was gonna talk about. What's the next slide, Casey? Sure, I was gonna launch into okay. the next part. So, um, but before I do, I just wanted to go ahead and mention that uh, this is the checklist that uh, Kat was referring to. And you can see it is very robust and very useful for helping you do that kind of analysis, including, as she mentioned, the inclusivity. So sorry, I didn't pull that up before. All right, so. Um, all right, so uh, next we're gonna talk about uh, actually finding those OERs. And as Kat had mentioned, we do have a guide that we have created. We pulled it from the Georgia uh, uh, Gwinnett College site. Um, and it has several different things on it that you might find useful. First off, it's gonna re really truly define what we're talking about with open educational resources and affordable textbooks. It's um, going to identify places for you to go for the library license materials. Uh, if you need to find Creative Commons materials, it has a link to that as well. Um, but it also includes finding and evaluating OERs, um, which is a list of recommended sites. So let me go ahead and click on that so you can take a look. These are some of the tools that, these are not the only tools that are out there for OERs, but these are some really useful tools for finding them. And what we have found is while it's nice to use a search engine, we have actually really enjoyed um, going into each of these selected ones individually for different types of purposes. So for today's session, I wanted to start off talking to you about OpenStax and telling you how a source like this really, it simplifies the types of quality that you can actually get with an OER. Then we're gonna go into MIT OpenCourseWare where you can um, gain an understanding of uh, how you can get things that are very authoritative, um, uh, again, from high quality, but how they might differ in terms of how they're designed and made up. And then finally, our favorite um, more broad collection of resources, things that are not from an individual publisher, but are um, identified from different types of publishers and then reviewed, uh, we wanted to go into Merlot. So if you um, are following along, we would love for you to go into these. So let me go ahead and put this in chat so that you can follow along and access this. So there's the URL in chat and let's begin. The first one that I wanted to talk about, like I said, is OpenStax. It's um, really well designed. And as you can see from their intro message, they've been getting a lot of use. Um, this is based at Rice University. 
and they do an excellent job with a lot of college level introductory textbooks. So if you're looking for something that's going to be more specific, like to religion and um, uh, um, music that are very specific to a, a more upper level class, you probably won't find it here, but it's really fantastic for things like the sciences and math. Um, I really found the astronomy one to be really helpful. I also think that it's very useful for economics. These are all developed with a team of individuals. So if we go into the astronomy one, you can see it's created by a team of individuals from extraordinarily well-respected institutions that have created this content to make it engaging and interactive. Um, it covers the core concepts that one might use in an introductory class um, and provides uh, nice detailed um, textbooks with graphics. And what's also great about this tool, so already we have an excellent publisher, somebody that we trust, Rice University, we would trust that institution to produce, to design something fantastic. It has a great collection of authors, um, again, that we would trust. They're trying to design it in an engaging way, um, but uh, they also include supplemental materials. So here we have the instructor resources and it includes a Canvas cartridge that you can just download. So all you have to do is do the free login and then you can download this cartridge. They'll just verify that you're an academic um, uh, instructor. And they also include other things like syllabus language, um, an instructor guide for the course and um, a test bank and for, um, for, for additional materials, you can actually go to some of these publishers, these tech, technology publishers. They recognize that there is more that could be done with the, their courses. And so they give you the option to work with other technology partners who have worked with this particular textbook and made additional content available. So that's something that you can add on. So this tool is completely free for students. Students would be able to get a guide to getting started. It, this particular one actually includes links to astronomy videos that they've collected from other places. And um, as you can see, it gives additional instructional materials for the students. But what I also love about this is that if a student doesn't wanna be using this free online material, they can order a print copy. And so for this one, it's a science textbook. So a hard copy is gonna be $58, paperback is $44. And it's truly optional for the student if they just wanted something in print for them to use. So they don't have to go through Amazon for this, but it is an option. And most of the textbooks offered by this organization are uh, less, um, are less uh, costly than this one. So that's OpenStax. And Amber, who is with us today, has actually used OpenStax in her courses. Amber, do you mind mentioning them very briefly? Sure, I don't mind. Uh, so for me, uh, I was teaching a course in sustainability and utilized the OpenStax sustainability course. I did not use the entire text. Um, I did do sort of a remix and pick uh, some of the chapters and utilize those um, instead of other materials that I would have perhaps uh, turned to a more traditional textbook um, and really found it to be, again, high quality content um, and uh, the students responded very favorably also to not having a, a cost to their textbooks. So that showed up in my course evaluations for sure. Great, thank you so much. So the final thing that I wanted to share about um, this particular textbook provider is that um, they actually include a statement about diversity. Um, and so not all of them do this, but this is another thing that you could look for as Kat mentioned. And you can see here that they are being very intentional about making sure that they are being inclusive of uh, different kinds of backgrounds and that students can see themselves in this work. So that was a really fantastic element that we liked about it. The next one that I wanted to talk about was MIT Open Course uh, where, and I have a screenshot here of that one. Um, so mainly I wanted to talk about MIT OpenCourseWare because 
uh, they list all of the courses that they do um, that uses electronic materials. And in some cases, they are providing mainly just their um, syllabus. So if I were to use one of these syllabi from uh, religion, what I'd find in here would be um, a collection of uh, readings that are hyperlinked. It identifies where you can find them. So if they're in JSTOR, um, and it gives you activities that you could be doing in class. So if you're looking for inspiration for your class, for instance, Islam and the media, then um, this could be a place to get started seeing what somebody, again, with authority at MIT, I know humanities is not their, uh, what they're noted for the most, but um, we definitely know that they're a top tier university and these are the materials that their professors are creating. So, um, and, plan and using inside their classrooms. So it's nice to have these well organized for that. A lot of their textbooks, however, are very science and math oriented and they're usually at a higher level. But I find that their supplemental materials, things like their syllabus, their activities, um, these are very useful. And you can see that they cover not just as OpenStax does the introductory, but they cover more of a range of topics. Um, and then finally, um, our favorite, like I said before, is Merlot, um, because it's great that there's publishers like OpenStax that are doing great introductory textbooks, but um, as faculty are trying to find the materials that they want, they need to be able to find materials that have been reviewed um, and are considered high quality and that hit the target audience that they're looking for. So Merlot has a very robust advanced search uh, feature. Um, and this is all managed by California State University. So again, it's, a, um, it's academics from a high quality institution that are selecting the materials that go into this repository. Um, these are more descriptions. It's like an index. Uh, the materials live elsewhere. And they make it easy for you to um, skim through, sorry, uh, skim through um, using various kinds of uh, qualifiers. So for instance, in this one, I searched by discipline first through the arts and then to music. And I was able to select that I wanted this level of audience and find ones that had peer reviewed. And what I ended up finding from this was not a ton of music related works, but there were two, one on musics and acoustics. Um, that was a site that people felt was very useful for talking about that topic. Um, and then there was also some um, a music theory uh, resource that was available. So this is how it can make it easier for you to figure out if there's something for your discipline and all of those include reviews with them. So that's um, basically the OERs and I'm gonna turn it over to Chris to talk about licensed library resources um, because for many topics like religion and um, music, you might find that you need things that are more specific to your discipline. Thanks Casey. Um, and when we're, when we're referring to licensed library resources, these are the materials usually in databases that the library purchases and then has an agreement, a contractual legal agreement with. So it mostly it's ebooks, online journals, uh, streaming media. And I'm going to go in and we're going to talk about some examples of each and how you can link those. And also we'll talk about, um, I'll give you some links in the chat that go to the directions for how to utilize these. Oh, can you go back one, one Casey? I just wanted to say one more thing um, about this. So what we're finding is that we, we want to leverage what we have. We want to these materials to be used. Um, they're certainly used. I mean, we have pretty high usage of our licensed materials, but I think that that can certainly be greater than what it is. And also, these are things that we've already purchased. Therefore, um, the, there's no additional cost to the student, which is always, always nice. Um, and I think, too, that as long as we're using it as per the agreement, there's no problem with putting links into Canvas or the student being able to access it wherever they are. So it's super helpful there. So first thing I want to talk about is eBooks. And I don't know if you all know this, but I asked Kat to give me a number and Kat provided that number. We have something like 415,000 eBooks that are full text and available to the Agnes community. Um, those are available now through WorldCat. The, 
I think, Kat, wouldn't you say like 99.99% of these are available through WorldCat at this point? Yeah, a good amount of them. Right. So most are there. Before you had to go through some, we, we had a few different ebook databases you had to go to. Now you can just go to WorldCat. You can limit your search to Agnes Scott, and then you can also limit to ebook. And you see, I've got a, a have a screen capture there, which makes it easier to search for those. And then once you are find materials that look to be of interest, you can click on view ebook, and then that'll give you full text access to those. Um, a few caveats, because sometimes uh, this can be a little confusing. If we don't own the ebook, like if you find an ebook and so you're not just searching for Agnes, but you're doing libraries worldwide and we don't own the ebook, you can ask and we can, uh, Kat would look into ordering it. Um, but what we can't do, we don't have the ability, unfortunately, to interlibrary loan an ebook. So certainly we can't a physical book, but not an ebook. So we would need to purchase that. And then also, if you're looking at these for, say, reserves, or you want multiple students to look at it at once, some books only have a single license, which means one user at a time can look at those. Some have two licenses, some, some are unlimited. So that's certainly something, too, we can let you know. Uh, oftentimes, when you land on the platform that the book is contained in, it'll tell you what the licensing is. But if that's not clear, you're not sure, certainly just email um, and usually can't, would let you know what that licensing is. Uh, basically, I think the reason you wanna know that is so that student understands if they can't get uh, into the book in that moment that maybe they need to wait an hour or two and then they could get into it later, but it is something to consider. Uh, if you can go to the next one. And here, another thing that's important when you're thinking about these and linking them for student use, you don't wanna use the URL at the top in the address bar, there's a link within the record in WorldCat, and that's what you want to link. Um, I believe the, the, from what we found, the URL at the top is going to work for a while, but it seems to become unstable over time. So that's why you want to do that. And then I am going to put in chat, um, I'm going to put the first URL is how to find ebooks. So it'll walk you through all the steps because you know, we're not really going to focus on that today. And then the other uh, link is to directions that will tell you how to save and share a list in WorldCat. And this is one of the things I think in WorldCat that, that we really like the most. You can create a list of materials. So it could be eBooks, uh, it could certainly be you know print books or something else, or just books that you wanted to share with someone that they could get through interlibrary loan or that we own or physically or as an eBook. You can make a list and then you can share it with you could share it with one of your students or you could share it with multiple students or the whole class and then they would be able to access that reading list which i think is super helpful uh next thing we wanted to talk about uh our articles through galileo discover i think most of you have probably used this before to search for materials i don't know offhand the exact number of journals and articles in galileo discover but i would think it's certainly in the thousands, I don't know, it could be in the millions, but it, it's quite a lot. There's a lot of great material in there. Uh, this is another one where you don't want to use uh, the URL and the address, you want to use the permalink. The, the, otherwise, it's not stable and you're not going to be able to get to that article. Um, and Discover does not include all of our database content. It's a great place to search for um, it's, it's certainly the, the place where you'll find the most uh, database content that we subscribe to, but it's not all. Uh, for all, you'd want to go to our A to Z list, which you can see over there on the left underneath that search um, input, and then you could search there. But overall, we uh, subscribe to 284 different databases. It seems like that's growing. Not, I don't want to say always growing, right? It's not always growing, but it does seem like every year we add a few. Um, so if there's not something that you can certainly give us input, but that's a great place for students to look to. Um, and I'll include another link here. And this is a link that goes to our faculty guide. And this tell, this gives you um, lots of information and directions for creating reading lists, linking articles and doing all those kinds of uh, things in Discover, super helpful. Um, and then next, I wanted to talk about, so Discover uh, is, is going to have all types of content, journal articles, books, um, 
newspapers, all sorts of materials. But we certainly, if you're thinking about, I know oftentimes uh, for classes, you will assign newspaper articles. And I think what we find sometimes is that students will email and say they their access to the New York Times, you know, where you, I think you, you get something like 10 free views and then they want to have you subscribe or charge for you. And students will ask about those and then we'll direct them into the databases. This is something where you can, through something like News and Newspapers, which has a subscription to uh, a number of uh, newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Guardian and others, you could link there and that would give students access. Uh, and in this case, there's a site tool here and within the site tool, you'd wanna use that URL that's in the citation. With all the databases, really it's best to go to, there's a permalink or a citation tool. There's something that will give you a URL that's stable. It's always better to do that. You know it's going to work over time and you won't have a student emailing you at three in the morning asking, why doesn't this work? Um, and I think the other thing that I wanna make sure that we talk about with this, and I think streaming video is a good segue. The majority of our budget is spent on our licensed material. It's something like 80 or 90%. Therefore, we really want this to be utilized as something we put a lot of money into to make sure it's available. Something that's become much more important over the last year, but certainly was important beforehand, is streaming video. Uh, the two that we would probably promote the most are Academic Video Online and Canopy, but Kat told me to make sure to really emphasize Academic Video Online because we pay an annual subscription and whatever you stream from that site, we don't have to pay any additional fees for which is hugely important. Canopy is a great streaming site. Uh, we do have some content that, that we have purchased, but otherwise that is going to incur an additional cost. So certainly we wanna look in academic video online first, but then we can look in Canopy. Another really nice thing about these uh, streaming services that we have are that they include public performance rights. So effectively, if you want to show one of these videos, I mean, you. Honestly, you could show it in your living room to your friends and it's perfectly fine. Certainly you can show it in a class because we're paying for those rights. You can effectively do whatever you want with these videos. There's no copyright limitations. And certainly because they're streaming, they're easier to show within a Zoom session than if you were trying to show a DVD or other content like that. Um, and oh, I should also mention that both include captioning, transcripts and embedding. So certainly you could take, a, say, a five minute segment of a video and then you could embed that or you can embed the whole thing. It's, it's got some really nice additional tools that you wouldn't find in something like YouTube or on a DVD. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, so that's what we wanted to present um, to just kind of give you a feel for what, so that, what are OERs, um, where can you find them, um, what are some of the potential challenges and with them and how to overcome those, and also how the library license materials might be useful to you. So what kind of questions do you have for us? I, I had one question, because I, I knew about Canopy, but I, I probably heard it and it just didn't sink in about the other video streaming. Um, we just got it. Oh, you just got it. Okay. Oh, we yeah, got yeah. It. You, you we got it in before. response. So. Yeah, you're hearing it now. This is <laughs> you're one of the first ones to hear about it. Okay, so how do you, if you wanted to explore it, how do you get there? Is it through the databases? Mm -hmm. If you go to the A to Z list, and then it is academic video online. Okay. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned it was in the A to Z list. You can also just search in uh, WorldCat. All of the mm -hmm. videos should should uh, be discoverable through there. So if you really? search in WorldCat and then you um, limit to e-video, it should pull up um, videos that are in there as well. Sweet. Which I don't know, Tracy, if you if you are aware of this, but um, if you assign a video and you want it through course reserves, we can link it through the reserves so the student would just log in to your reserves and then see those videos there. Okay. Oh, nice. I could also like embed it in my Canvas page, the link right there, and it would immediately go to it after they logged in or what have you. Exactly, yep. Okay, cool. So what if they don't have it on academic video online or and it's not available on canopy what's the best thing to do 
uh, to get the video. Well, you know, we sent out, you know, we sent out the uh, reserves form, you yeah, would yeah. basically just you would look in the catalog, we don't have it and then just submit a purchase request. And then cat will try to find it in another repository. All right. So you don't have to worry about that. That's not on you to find a platform that it's hosted from. We'll, we'll oh. find the platform. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Thanks. All right. Any other questions that we can answer? Um, as Kat had mentioned, we are very happy to help out with um, talking with you about these particular collections. Um, I know at least Kristen, Chris and I are super excited to always go through a collection of resources um, and probably have already done it for your class anyway before you've even asked us because we're just always exploring those things. So feel free to tell us about a class that you might be doing next semester and we can um, assist in, in terms of trying to see what might be out there. Um, just set up an appointment with us using the appointment setting tool on our library homepage. Well, we really appreciate all of your time. So thank you so much for coming in and tell your colleagues. We will be sharing this link with you and uh, let your colleagues know um, how this might be helpful to them, particularly your colleagues that are doing introductory classes in some of the things like the sciences, business, uh, psychology, things like that. Oh, hey, Casey, do you, do you want to put the... Um the link to the skill builder site in oh yeah i can do that too um so uh you tell them why so casey who has spearheaded this the skill builders which is i think genius um <laughs> has created a guide that has all the videos on there um and then also like the world cat um uh tutorials that I have posted there. So anything you can think of that we've done, podcasting, finding eBooks, uh, scary stories at Agnes, all those kind of things are on there. And that's, that'll be the repository. And hopefully, I mean, uh, the idea is that, you know, again, it was really Casey's idea and has, has spearheaded this. And it's been a great start. And then as we move forward over, you know, next semester, we'll start to branch out and do more and more. So if you have ideas or things that you think would be helpful too, we'll place those there. Because I know, I know we received at least one or two emails where um, faculty said they couldn't come to today. So the idea that, oh, we'll park these there and then faculty can find them later too. Well, this and if, is you, great. if you want us to um, schedule you for next semester, maybe you want a specialized one on uh, from Chris that would be on finding, um, commentaries for religious texts, or maybe you want one from me that's about finding particular musical resources. Um, we can do a specialized research skills that kind of delve into more of your specialized databases, or we can, um, like I said, these are our core ones right now, trying to get at those more common uh, skills that people are uh, needing to impart to students in their classes, and they may not have time for us to come in. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. It was great to see all of you. It's thank good you. To you. And I'm, I know you didn't see me, but you felt me or heard yes, me. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was cramming food into my.